Uh, oh, door side for sure. Hey, Sandberg's your name? Every day that I'm home and just working, I come down here on to the pier, walk along it. Especially good now for my leg. Part of physical therapy is to try to walk as much as possible, so get the leg flowing. I mean, everything out here is in public. You can't, you can't. Uh, there's no kind of like expectation of privacy when you're out in public doing stuff. So you can be photographed, you know. Yeah. So I don't really worry about it. I mean, I feel like you get in tune with this weirdness down here. Yeah. It's going to be weird doing my daily routine now with people following me with a camera, though, actually. I could be regretting it. Also, did I mention that I feel like I'm in a real bad face state for this thing? Yeah, you said that. A cold know. sore. Pop uh, zit. You got CGI. You got to fix it in post? Yeah. <laughs> Make me look a little slightly less haggard than I am. Look in the mirror, I'm like, hey, I look all right today. And then I went and did like an America team photo shoot thing. I looked so bad. I was like, man, these photos look like shit. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Ed's different in the sense that he embodies the original and what I consider the true spirit of skateboarding. He's a weirdo. And what's really weird about Ed is kind of how normal he is and some of the subject matter he chooses for his art too. It's really, since we're talking about Ed, I guess I can launch into art fag talk. Like it's very Lynchian. It's very much like David Lynch. You know like David Lynch? He finds the weird and the macabre in the mundane. Normal people, normal towns doing normal things. And Ed's very much a product of normal suburbia and Huntington Beach and that whole weird area. Sorry. Hey, what's up, dude? That's my most liked photo ever. <laughs> I, I don't know how to explain it, why it happened. But I know, I got like, they love I your mustache 15, or something. 15,000 followers off you that day. I shot a photo of this guy at a <laughs> shirt that just said Lurker on. And it's my most liked photo ever, <laughs> by far. Like 14,000 <laughs> likes or something, Tony Hawk style <laughs> likes. <laughs> and I can't explain it. And I don't even know you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good day. You too, man. Always good running team. My whole skate life started when I hit Huntington Beach. We lived in Corona in a trailer park. My dad was abusive and uh, would hit us and stuff. And he took off with, my mom keeps saying she was 14. I think she was 16, but either way, she was underage. Le literally left town with our babysitter. You know, he's like 40 or something. And he leaves, like, bails my mom, leaves two kids, my, me and my brother for some 14, 16 year old girl who just used him for a ride to like Colorado and then dumped him. And so that was it, like our family's broken. We moved to Huntington to like live with our grandparents and then they finally like got us an apartment. Yeah, it was on Alabama, the street, and then Ed lived down the block. From what I can remember, Ed's last name was Herring. I don't know if he wants to get into that with why he changed it, but when I first met Ed, his name was Ed Herring. I met Ed in Huntington Beach, California in 1987. Like already his nickname was like Ollie Ed because he could Ollie super high. He wore the same clothes every day, like some cut off pal sweats, I think, or maybe they were vision sweatpants cut off. He was really poor. Like, like people made fun of him for how poor he was. It seemed like Ed had a pretty challenging upbringing. We lived on the corner of Huntington and Memphis. We just get all these little kids knocking on the door at all times of the day, going, hey, you got any stickers? You got any old boards? You got this or that? It was that period that Ed Templeton came knocking on the door asking for stickers, and he started bugging us more. He started coming in and just sitting down, watching videos, and we would basically give him stickers, old boards, and then he would actually just go sell them at Huntington Beach High School um, to make money for himself and just kind of get by. Having no dad meant that I could run all over my mom and do whatever I want, so I could skate and just kind of like fuck school and everything because she had no control over us. And she was like not probably like, like mentally not, e not really able to work. My mom was like, when she was a kid, she had, a, she had the chicken pox and stopped breathing when she was an infant and almost died. Because of that, she had a little bit of brain damage. So she was able to raise two kids fine and everything, but she's super simple. She can't understand concepts. She has a hard time doing math and stuff. So my grandparents were basically taking care of us. His grandparents were kind of like the backup support for 
Ed's mom, but they were also like, you know, they could get away with a lot. I would do the lamest stuff. I was such an asshole. I remember one time, I don't know, she got, she would yell at me for something. And I had a bowl of cereal on the like arm of the couch and I just like slapped it off, milk everywhere and just like walked out and like, clean that up bitch kind of thing. Like it's fucked, you know? Like I, I was just a, like an asshole kid. Like, Do you think you were just, you were like angry? I mean, I don't know. I think it was like broken home. I mean, this all this kind of ties back to like how you find skateboarding, you know? At least for my generation, I think almost everyone that was my friend at that time came from a broken home, like some kind of alienation. I came out from England in like, 84. Huntington, just kind of where the, the spot was. You'd have all the skiers from Bob Schmelzer, to, I mean, Pear Willander, a lot of the freestyle guys on that era. Like a whole world of skateboarding was there that I didn't really know. This is probably like 85. And I saw these kids basically one day just skate by and they like dropped off the curb, across the street and then tapped up the curb. It's just like, fuck, what the fuck? That was it. I was blown away. Ed, you just kind of saw him as a little kid, but he used to freestyle a lot at the beginning. So it was him and um, his next door neighbor, Jeremy Ramey. They just both come down and hang out and do all weird freestyle shit with us. So it was pretty funny. The very first skate crew like, was this kid, Eric Estrada. He was the best kid around. Kind of a masochist, sort of like an alpha male who like, realized he had a minion of kids that were kind of fall hanging around him, of which I was one. Eric Estrada, I've heard of him. Does he, did he end up being a mags and sponsor? No, he never really you did anything. Of the guy person. from Chips. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, everyone has those stories like, there was this one dude, I don't care. He was in fucking California and he lived next door to Ed Templeton. The dude could have been like the greatest of all time. But he quit to be a gangster. Like. By the time I was nine, like, I was already, like, the main people I'd skate with were Ed, Skippy Pronier, Jake Burns, Aaron Devine, Jose Serda, Derek Roach, Steve Robert. But I wasn't like, let me get it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, like, scared of them. Because, like, when you're eight and people are, like, 12 and 13, they're, like, full-blown fucking adults. Because I had two older brothers, so I knew, like, these are older dudes. And older dudes, like, jack off and shit. Ed clearly uh, represents the second generation of, of core street skating, and he took a lot of that freestyle influence. So pay and play was the freestyle mecca of skateboarding in the late 80s. And that's where Don Brown would ride, Per Willander would ride, and that's where a lot of that progressiveness came from. I don't know how it happened, but we used to take our lawn tramps to this like pay and play racquetball courts right next to Huntington Beach High School just like impromptu. It was like Friday night or Saturday, I forget, like one night a week. And it was a huge thing. Like there would be hundreds of kids there. Pay and play plays a key role in all this stuff because it was really the melting pot. And a couple of the kids from around here would bring quarter pipes. Their mom would like literally drive them from their house. We'd put the ramp up to the wall and do wall, wall jams. Like, you know, we were basically trying to like create Savannah Slamma from the videos, you know, like in a jump ramp line, some shitty PVC slider bar. And it turned into this thing where everybody from around Southern California knew about it. I mean, Ray Barbie would come, Don Brown would be freestyling there. Gons and Nada showed up. And at some of these Friday nights were literally epic, like on the scale of like, they, it advanced street skateboarding. Like, do you not understand? The first time I saw Gons, like, on a skateboard, he did a, he did a fucking the no comply over the parking block. He might as well fucking levitated. Yeah. I was like, like what? I, I was like scared and happy and like yeah. freaked out all at the same time because it was like, that's Gons. And it was like, oh my God, that was Gons. And then it was like, and then he was gone. And then those dudes are like, the dudes I look up to and they're like, Whoop, and like, it was insane. I mean, it was like a mind-blowing experience. The pay and play session sort of gave you a look. Everybody from Southern California is coming to this spot to skate. So I was watching things advance. And what people don't really realize, in Thrasher there was an article mid, mid 80s, 10 Impossible Tricks by Rodney Mullen. Those impossible tricks became the foundation of skateboarding from the 90s on. Well, Ed and his generation looked at it as a kid. Well, it's being done. So what if he did it on a freestyle board? Let's do it on a big board. I remember at this point there was no precedent to like 
calling a, a line a line, one of the things that me and Jason would do, we call them lines. Let's cruise across the court and do three tricks in a row. We just spent hours just fucking around doing flat ground lines. And Ray Barbie was doing no complies and stuff. So his, he was doing kickflips and stuff, but he was also doing a lot of like no complies and shifties and all this stuff. Like, so he had a totally different style. But, but we were all doing the same kind of thing. Like just, it was part of incorporating lines into it. I don't know. I have to imagine that this was also happening in different areas, like simultaneously. It wasn't just like us. I just don't know about it as much, but I, th I think we were some of the early people doing that kind of stuff. We'd be doing all the flippy dippy stuff. And then Ed, you'd see him start incorporating more freestyle tricks. I know he was like hill flip man, you name it. He could pretty much do all the freestyle stuff on his street wall, which was pretty cool at the time. We'd skate with Don Brown and try his moves. We'd be like, I wonder if we can do what you're doing on our street boards. We were doing impossibles. I mean, that was like a freestyle move. Jason Lee had three flips on lock. We wanted to like push it further from flat ground and take it to other stuff. So I remember there was a little four stair in the high school. And I remember pulling Don specifically like, hey Don, come over here and check this out. And I did an impossible down the four stair. And he was just like, oh fuck. I remember that. Yeah, that was, what happened? that was, it's weird. It's like there was, I've been in skate with him for, gazillion years but there's certain defining moments I always remember and that was one of them just Ed you know doing all the impossibles down the you know one for Jason Lee 360 flip and it was just like it was at that point when I really realized that skateboarding is going to change forever and it's like street skating and kind of the elements of freestyle have merged and it's going to take skateboarding in a whole new direction. I really feel that Ed and Jason Lee were two of the pioneers that really helped. There's a bee. <laughs> you okay, Ed? At this point, I'm like good friends with Jason Lee. We're like, that we're, we call ourselves two peas in a pod. We all every day we'd go skating, you know. So when Bosch Monster came to me and said, I, I want you on Circle A, like my first thought was like, you have to have Jason. Like, we're the same good, you have to take us both. And he was just like, oh, I don't want Jason. I don't know why, but he's just like, I don't want Jason, I just want you. And I was so conflicted, like, fuck, I can't, I can't, if I get on. Jason was like, also kind of mean. He was also the alpha male too. Like, let me get some, Holmes. And by the microphone. <laughs> so I was also afraid, like, fuck, if I get sponsored before Jason, like, he probably won't be my friend anymore. So I was kind of scared, you know? Like, the Ed and Jason were, like, were really close. Like, they were like, they were like the two dudes coming up together, and they skated together all the time. And I begged Schmelzer, I was like, please, like, put Jason on. And he wouldn't, but he gave Jason a board. So, you know, sort of like a consolation prize that we both had these, like, prototype boards that he made. But that, I don't know, that was my first sponsor. Ed had the first ad ever of anyone 50 50 a handrail, and it was his first ad, and it was a Circle A ad, and I remember they didn't put his name on the ad. Yeah, no name. It's crazy, because I was born Ed Herring. When my mom and dad divorced, she changed our name legally back to Templeton, which is her maiden name. There's a chance that this might have been Ed Herring, which would have been weird instead of Ed Templeton, but either way, Bob Schmelzer left my name off. I still don't know why to this day, why he left my name off the ad, and I was kind of bummed, because it was like, at that point, it was kind of groundbreaking, you know? like. No one had seen a 50-50 on a handrail, and to not get the credit for it, it was just all credit to the company, like, oh, someone's 50-50 in a rail. Oh, Circle A, not, you know what I mean? Not at Templeton, but you know, whatever. So I'm 14. There's a whole diversionization story that goes on this when I was 14 too. Maybe I shouldn't talk about it. What's the diversionization story? Just this girl that lived by Eric's house. There was a. There was a bump in front of her house that a root had made in the sidewalk. It was like a lawn ramp kind of, so we'd skate it all the time. And this girl would like watch us from the step. <laughs> and uh, one day she shows, comes up and has a bunch of, a whole handful of Vision stickers. Vision's like gold for us kids. It's like the best company ever. We were like, whoa, how do you get all these stickers? And she's like, oh, my friend Greg, the guy who does art there, you know the psycho stick graphic, he drew it. <laughs> I was like, whoa, you know, amazing. Somehow I'm like, chatting this girl up now. I didn't know how old she was until way later, but I'm Is just, she she's 24. <laughs> so yeah, I got statutory raped, I guess. <laughs> That's the thing is my mom couldn't know about it. I was just kind of stoked that someone gave me the time of day. Like I didn't have any like 
adult people that actually would talk to me like a person, you know? You're like, a, you're a kid at that point. Like you get treated like a kid. But she, like she was in a way pivotal too, led into this like other world, this like artsy girl who knew a bunch of art people and would play the Smiths and Billy Bragg and stuff. The first time we had sex, Louder Than Bombs was on. You know, it's like, I have these like pivotal moments. But uh, um, I don't know. So that's just a, a side story. <laughs> You know, all my skating at that point was wishing I was Chris Miller. Again, this is like a street skater who watched basically vert videos and bowl videos and just, you know, that's what we had. We didn't have like a lot of street videos except for the, maybe the contest videos to watch. So street skating was still at that early age of like, we're sort of copying vert, you know? To me, it was like skateboarding's epitome was Chris Miller. I was like, oh my gosh, this is my favorite company. And then I heard they wanted to sponsor me. And so like, it was like a heartbeat, like I didn't even, if I could write for Schmidt Sticks, that's it. So Schmidt Sticks, Paul Schmidt came from Florida. Um, he was the first to really do really cool rails that were rounded. Back in the 80s, uh, rails were pretty mandatory on us and he skateboard. And then he developed, went further into doing boards. And he had a real skill for being able to really um, create some of the best concaves and the, 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 the greatest probably innovations within skateboards at that time. Use your own hands, now, don't look at it, use your hands. Your eye will fool you how something feels. I moved here from Florida with this tiny little company. The skateboard market went kaboom. So now I'm shipping shitloads of boards. Vision said, here's a building, build a wood shop where I built samples and prototypes and things. So Schmidt Sticks always made the most progressive boards. The riders would follow the brand because of that. And I was ready to basically bail and bailing meant you made your own boards. I was only an am for Schmidt Sticks and they, they basically pulled me aside and said, there's something in the works. We're leaving Vision. Schmidt Six was actually owned by Vision and Brad Dorfman, but he actually bought the name off of Paul Schmidt, so Paul Schmidt kind of got screwed, so he doesn't even own his own name. <laughs> so he lost his own brand. I had a licensing agreement with Schmidt Six, and basically they'd pay me a royalty. He owned the business and the infrastructure. I didn't like that, that he owned everything and skaters didn't own it. So we started New Deal, and Andy Howe, Steve Douglas, and I became equal partners, like three amigos. We're gonna go forward and make this thing happen. And New Deal started with a whole mystery. People didn't know what was happening, what was going on with it, where it was coming from. So we made this promo video. The promo video was out before anybody even knew what the brand was. A year later, uh, New Deal was selling more skateboards than Spistics ever had in its history. There was a New Deal promo, and that's where you first saw Ed Templeton with the, and now we're oh so happy. And, and like he just, cause what did he do? He did the nose bonk. He was early, an early nose bonker, the one foot. And then he did the impossible lip in that video. And it's like, okay, like you could learn a nose bonk and you could learn a one foot. And then the impossible lip, you're just like, ah, you know. When that video hit, I think it was like, it put me on the map for sure. Basically they called me and said, we're making a promo video we're coming to your house tomorrow to film. And that was literally it. Like, you know, one day. I just did every move I could do within the time they were there, and that became your video part. That's how it was back then. From a young age, I really was in a new deal, and Ed was one of my favorite guys, you know, with his air walks, and you could tell he kind of just had a, like, good, uh, a good eye for color, like, with, like, the shoes and the board he chose and everything, and he always had good shapes. He always had a cool square tail and like a squared off nose. So I loved his boards, always. That is the reissue, <laughs> the toy machine reissue. And then the original New Deal. So that's my first board, first graphic. Really like the idea of having my name going up around the nose for some reason. And don't want to do that. This was a, essentially this is lifted from a Metropolitan Museum of Art catalog. They had this sort of Egyptian cat, like little statue they would sell. Well, I can remember when Ed wanted the nose to be longer than the tail. And I just thought it was this crazy context. So when his board came out, it had this huge gigantic nose on it, it had two sets of holes. And if you were a street skater, you ride the back holes. If you were a vert skater, you ride the front holes. So when New Deal came out, it was really exciting because Schmidt Sticks was rad, you know? 
And then when New Deal came out, it was like this whole new thing. And it was like this whole new identity and everything. And like Andy Howell and Ed and all the graphics and stuff. And I remember when the boards came out, like I was so psyched. I think Ed's like outsider-ness kind of thing, even though he was like the younger guy, like his sensibility kind of like popped through. Their whole thing was dope. So inside of here is some weird old woodcut, sort of like an end of day scene. It's like a riot, but there's skeletons mixed in, sort of like raping people. So I like the idea that you really wouldn't be able to see that, but I thought I was being super subversive. <laughs> Useless wooden toys is like, yeah, that shit affected me big time, man. That was the one where like Ed was like, I was like, dang, this guy's so rad, you know what I mean? That video played a big, big part in my skateboarding, in my life. I loved New Deal at that time. I mean, like, Smith was a traditional 80s company. I mean, yeah, Lucero with the bars, you know, like, that was a best selling board. I mean, like the rip saw, all these things were like, fully like in that vision sort of mold. A new Deal came out and essentially Andy Howell was like the art director of it. It was like so perfect for like what a teenage skater kid was thinking about at that time and was like doodling and drawing themselves in their home sketchbooks and cartoony-esque graphics that were like graffiti related. All that was like what New Deal was representing at that time and yeah, that was definitely a, a cool aspect of, of what they were doing. Yeah, like I was definitely like a New Deal kid. I remember going into a skate shop and probably trying to buy like some Powell video or something and the guy going like, this is the video you want. You want this, you want useless wooden toys. With skateboarding, when the company has a strong connection to the riders and allows some sense of freedom for the riders to have an expression off their board as well as on, kids identify with them the most because it's true and it's real. It's not like some made up you know, graphic design guy that's like, here's your logo, here's your thing, and this is what you are. It's these people actually like making something together and, and those things are always more powerful. And I think that New Deal was from the outside looking in on it, that was the style that it was in, you know? And the reason it was called the New Deal is because Andy and Paul wanted to like kind of come up with a new company idea where the writers had the influence. Before it was like literally the art department just gave you stuff, you know? I mean, that's why I started doing my own graphics. My first meeting with those guys, they kind of laid that out like, it's your thing, you're in charge of your image. You can, you know, when we do an ad, you can say what it says in there. This is my first New Deal ad for being pro. This is the one that says, go by Ed Templeton's board. It's the one with the crappy graphics. Because I was super hyper aware that this was not a good graphic it's to the standard of that day, you know. And I mean, my ad is, uh, ollie to tail on a bank to curb. That's maybe like a foot and a half high. First pro ad. <laughs> I, yeah, I can't explain it. And then Andy Howell's ads were way different. The only thing that kept them the same was that it was black and white with a yellow background. But otherwise, Andy's ads were, had like these, you know, hip hoppy drawings and stuff. And then my ad had like a little sketch that I did with like some weird Kurt Vonnegut inspired text, you know. It was very clear from the start Ed was a creative individual. You know, and his creativity, we look at where he's gone now through his skateboarding, through his art, through his photography, and it's like, he's just living that creative life. It's really neat to see that and see how skateboarding can empower someone to go forward on that path. Let's escape whenever you want. Who was on it? Like, who were skaters you went on tours with, and who did you like on New Deal? We didn't go on tour. That's another interesting thing. Like, uh, the there was no tour. I mean, the, my first tour that I went on, New Deal, I don't think had the money to do a tour. We didn't have the organization. So what happened was, I became friends with Mike V. So Mike, you know, would be in Southern California and they connected all the time and skated together and they would go on tour together, you know. And Mike V was a couple years older and he sort of drafted that along, you know. 
And to us as a sponsor, it was great because we weren't in the place of like ready to have a New Deal tour or anything like that. This all happened through our girlfriends, essentially. I mean, Mike's current wife is was best friends with Deanna. And they knew each other before they ever got involved with skater kids, you know? And, oh, this, wait, let me explain this. So Jason Lee's girlfriend was Ann, who's married to Mike now. We all ditched school one day to go to a Chili Peppers concert up in LA. This is 86 when the Chili Peppers were cool. Um, <laughs> let me throw that in there. And and brought her friend Deanna, and that's how I met Deanna, basically, like on that car ride up to LA. It's hot, and we stopped to get like a drink at like a soda at a soda machine. I get like a Dr Pepper or something. I'm about to drink it, and right as I get there, Jason Lee just comes up and snatches it out of my hand and like drinks the whole thing. And I was like, "Fuck!" And I was all sad. And Deanna's like, Deanna tells me later, she's like, "That's when I like fell in love with you. Basically, you were so cute. Jason was being mean to you, and you just kind of pouted." I had the sense that he didn't have any money. And it was, I think it was at that moment, I just saw you looked up with those big green eyes and your braces and your little skate dude and zits. And I'm like, oh my gosh, he's so cute. <laughs> and then it was just on. It was like, I don't know. I just, he was so sweet. And so she told Anne like later that she thought I was cute. And I was like, let's hook this up. Let's go on it. Let's get a date going. So we went, me, Aunt Jason and Anne and me and Deanna went to go see Fatal Attraction at the movie theater. I had a... Uh, Acid washed je uh, denim jeans and an acid washed jacket. I don't know what was what I was what I was thinking. It was like your and I was trying to grow a scum stash. Yeah, I was like I thought I was dressing nice. Yeah. And after the date, I like went in for a kiss and missed and ended up kissing her like up here on the cheek. And I was too petrified to like make it up. I just like was like oh and like walked off all weird like uh. But yeah, like that's how we started. That's how me and Deanna met basically and started going out. We had one more time of hanging out and then on the third hangout. I just remember sitting on a curb with Ann watching you skate and then you sat down really quick and you're like, is my your boyfriend now? I just remember looking at Ann and she like kind of shrugged her shoulders. I'm like, sure. <laughs> Never been a part of it. You got stuck with me right then. So I was, I became friends with Mike V because over time now Jason and Ann broke up. Somehow Ann started dating Mike V. He would like come and visit Ann in like Huntington Beach and stuff. Me and Jason would go skate with Mike V a lot. Basically, I was on New, New Deal was happening. Mike was on World, but we were we were good friends. So he invited me on tour. That's what your question was like. What about tours of New Deal? And I said we never toured New Deal. My first tour, 1990, was with Mike V on a World Industries tour. Essentially, World was much more established as a business group. You know, they were doing tours and things. We just weren't at that place yet. Mike V is one of those people to help start that model and take that further. Mike V had this like work ethic of like. We're going on a fucking tour every day, show up at a shop, kick ass, no fucking around. Mike was kind of like sort of at odds with Rocco a little bit. Seriously, you're gonna lose your job here, all you guys. I was just like, I'm doing my own fucking tour. I don't wanna do a World Industries tour. I'm gonna pick my own people. And he is friends with the New Jersey connections with Felix and Dune who were on World. But he liked me, so he's just like, you know what, I'm just doing a tour with my boys, Felix and Dune, and I'm gonna bring Ed. And so he just set it up as like the Valley Summer Tour. It wasn't even like billed as a World Industries Tour. It was just like tour with these guys. And that is really the start of my pro career. Mike, the lady, Ed's number one. Chris Pettis, you're the very top. It came a long way to make a lot of people happy. Give him a big man for welcome. Yeah, let's do it. This is all like world expanding shit. I'm like, Literally lived in the suburbs my whole life here in Southern California. And now I'm like crossing the country for the first time, seeing all these different states, seeing all these different people, getting in all these situations. I mean, there's like a thousand stories I could tell you from that first tour. Being in the South with Mike looking like a skinhead, like crazy. We almost got our killed a bunch of times. And I wasn't part of their group, so it was like really weird. And it's like, I feel like Felix made me cry on part, some part of the tour, you know, he like was being mean to me, like they would make fun of me. I don't know, but like, literally my summer was all of June, 30 demos in 30 days from the West Coast to the East Coast. You know, I was seasoned at that point. Every, say skating a new obstacle course every single day and showing off and like make doing all your moves. I was ready for a contest. And that is what primed me to go to Europe that year and wreck all those contests. And then I think he had a chance to go skate the Europe contest one year. And so, it was a big deal 
for him, like consider dropping out. And I think he went and talked to his grandparents about it. And his grandparents were like, you'll learn more traveling the world than you will in high school. Once we left the tour, it was like on my own. I was like, I was basically like, you're gonna be flying from New York to Europe. No one picked me up or anything. I'm just in an airport in Frankfurt going, I'm screwed, man. And uh, Jake Phelps was getting off a plane and I didn't know who he was, but I'm like, that guy looks like a skater. So I kind of went over there like, thinking like these guys must be coming for the contest because they look like skaters. They had skateboards and stuff. And I kind of like went over there and sort of made myself seen by them. Like, and luckily he's just like, a Templeton. Cause like Jake is like, you know, skate encyclopedia. I was like, yeah, come with us. And he helped me like get to the hotel and find the New Deal people that didn't pick me up. It's kind of crazy cause it's like, I'm young. There's an establishment of guys, you know? Dressing, Hasoy, Oster. I mean, this is that generation still. And the stuff we were doing was different. You know, Dressing's line might be like, Creole slide the quarter pipe, you know, do a fat air over the hip, like board slide the handrail. You know, I'm like scorching one foots over the hip and like impossibling, but then I would do a one foot board slide, which no one had seen before, you know? He was just progressive. Simple as that, and the guys that were sort of resting on their laurels or where they'd been in Ed's foundation wasn't set yet. His mind was still open. So it's a generational perspective, you know? So Ed, Ed was an icon for a new generation of skateboarders. He had a huge following, you know, in mainland Europe and England. Ed is so unique, you know? So at that time, that uniqueness stood out even more than now. And uh, he was on fire at that time as well. Had his own bag of tricks and was really good in contests, really good in demos. and just creatively wide open. I was a huge Ed Templeton fan. It felt crazy winning, because at this point, the Moonster contest was big. I mean, stadium filled with kids screaming, and the whole town got overrun with skaters. This was like the only time, I think, in my lifetime, I ever have that kind of situation. So you, you did Europe, how many, con did you win one contest? There was three contests, and I won all of them. <laughs> like I said, I was like, I was ready. Did you come I mean, home, like, I conquered Europe? I mean, in a way, it was kind of like that. I mean, like, because there were, back then they covered contests. So like, I remember like getting a bunch of coverage in the mag and it was like those two months of 1990 really like established me as like this guy, you know? Flying back from the contest I won in Europe, another thing, rad thing Paul Schmidt did, got me a limo to pick me up at the airport. So he was like, oh, let's get a limo for our skate star. Deanna was there dressed up all fancy and picked me up. I'd see guys do things special and I wanted to be part of making that special thing happen. In his first year as a rookie, nobody else in that era did what he did, put out banging video parts that set the tone for skateboarding and won contests. You know, they, they didn't go together. That was my peak. I'm like super fortunate to have had a couple peaks in a way, but that was my like real peak was 1990. I mean, 1990 was like, you're a turn pro. The only time I had covers on mags was in 1990, Transworld, and Thrasher, oh, right, Transworld I think was 89, and then Thrasher was in 90. But when it came out in Transworld, it was like, and things took a really long time to come out back then, it seemed like. He knows granted that rail, that poster, oof, he's one of, he's one of those dudes now. Like, he's like, like he's not, he's like Nodis now. And it was bugged out, and I was still Mega Young. And that's it, I never had like one of the major magazines covers again. Um, Still to this day? Yeah. One, one Transworld, one Thrash? Yeah. Or... They did like a cover like a cover with a bunch of people's so faces on it. To this day, you haven't? Mm -mm. Never Big Brother either. I was bros with those guys. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's I mean, I just like... assumed he had a Big Brother cover for the longest time. He never, and he's like, no, I never did. Like, really? Like, we never gave you a cover? How did we do that? He's like, you guys want to be rail sliding with my boner? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, yeah. <laughs> And Big Brother, it was like, I, I think I was like such good friends with those guys that it was, it was almost like a joke. He would be like, I'll give you the cover right now if you like board set a rail with a boner. I want to, I want, that's what I want for the cover. Like, I think you might be the only person who might try it. So if you board set a rail coming at the camera with a boner naked, I'll give you the cover. And I was just like, fuck that. I'm not going to do that. So like, I never got the cover. But then every year since then, like the next year, 91, me and Mike did our own demo. Just literally me and him in the van. Nobody. from different companies. Yeah. No, I think this point, this time it was new, he was on New Deal at this point. Oh, you got a, yeah. He was on New Deal in 92, I think. And we just did a tour by ourselves. Again, it was set up a huge like 30 demo, 30 day type thing. Massacre, masochist tour. Yeah. 
At some point, Ed said, hey, can Mike be on the team? I confirmed that, you know, he didn't have a contract tying him up or anything like that. And Mike kept on having all this pressure from World where basically you're old, retire, get the hell out of here. We don't want you around anymore. And that eventually is what, you know, led Mike to being on a new deal and then eventually led them to try to be their own deal. That's what happened, basically. I mean, got on New Deal, who I had been telling him, like, this is a great company, man. It's really cool. We get to do it. You get to be in control, like, whatever. But I think when he got on New Deal, Mike came from a situation on World Industries where he was making, like, 10 grand a month off board sales. I mean, they were cooking those double kick farm animal boards. You know, I'm making, like, three to eight grand a month, depending on board sales, which at that time was like, this is epic, you know? But I think making three grand for Mike, who had been used to making 10 grand, was a huge lifestyle change. And so I think he, his thinking was like, let's start our own company, we'll make all the money, it'll be great. And so I kind of like got bought into that and said, yeah, let's do it, you know? So I like essentially quit New Deal to start TV with Mike. Mike's an enigma, man. He like has been basically fighting everything his whole life and fighting himself. I mean, it's like the Mike I know is so different from the Mike that is presented to public in a way. You left New Deal for you and him to start a company, and that was out of vision. Brad Dorfman. Brad Dorfman, originally, yeah. So we did TV, which I think in his brain was Templeton Valley, but for me it was always te television. I didn't want to name a company after myself. We had writers, uh, we did some ads and stuff, and Mike was sort of like the guiding influence. Like I didn't really get to like, my stuff was in there, my drawings and stuff, but it was like, I think Mike was calling the shots. We left Brad Dorfman. What Essentially, Brad Dorfman? Dorfman was just over controlling, you know, like trying to like make us do stuff. I'm super vague on all this stuff. I just know we weren't happy there. So we leave him to go with this guy, Dean. We changed it to television, basically like from TV to television. This guy, Dean is like, sort of an entrepreneur type dude who was coming up with ideas to make companies. So we took television to this guy. He was like, that's the kind of guy he was. He like realized like, I can do this company, do it here. I guess what happened is Mike had a certain lifestyle and money that he was making. He had just had his first daughter and I just stopped getting, a, I didn't get a paycheck. And I was, so I was calling, like, I remember calling Dean like, dude, where's my paycheck, you know? And he's just like, I gave it to Mike. And so I called Mike, like, Mike, where's, do you have my paycheck? He's like, no, Dean has it. So I'd call Dean back, like, dude, you're fucking with us, man. Like, where's my paycheck? So then I call Mike back up and he's like, I'm like, man, I talked to Dean. He swears that he gave the money to you. Like, do you have it? Like, what's up? And he's just like, are you accusing me of stealing your money? Click. Then the phone rings again and it's Ann. And she's like, Mike's coming over there to kick your ass. So I'm like, fuck. Mike's gonna come over and start beating me up. But then finally, like, I got on the phone with him again. I'm like, what's going on? He just buried the hatchet with me. He's just like, dude, I mean, he's like, I need that money. I just, ha I just had a daughter. It's like, I, I have bills to pay. I have stuff I'm doing and I, I just, I can't, I can't afford to give you that money. So I'm like, essentially you're kicking me off my company. Yeah. And I was like, okay, you know, fine. And like, we didn't speak for years, you know? For me, I was just like, I'm out of a job starting right now. You know, I'm a pro skater, I got nothing going, I have no company, I have, no, I have nothing. But I think I went six or seven months with no pay. And so living off whatever savings I had. Even though at the time, he was probably like a little bit not as popular, it was probably in the kind of after the New Deal, a little bit of a wane, you know? I always just like tried to shoot with like people that wherever you go, they're gonna be psyched, they're not like, Take me to the 16 inch ledge only, please, you know? Fuck it. Like, I just want to have fun with people. You're so in my video, Thomas. Oh! <laughs> I mean, it was like skateboarding was dead. It was at a, a low point in skateboarding. That era of like the small wheels, big pants, pressure flips, but I was doing that kind of stuff skating wise, you know, like all that, all that stuff, you know, back foot flips and shit. Yeah! I didn't want to just ride for someone at this point. But I've had a taste of doing a company and I kind of was like, oh, it'd be cool to start, a, like a, do a company if I could, you know? Because I had already called like Jerry Fowler, Ethan Fowler, all those guys were like, yeah, we'll, we'll ride for you, whatever you're doing. And every day getting up and calling people. I called every company and pitched like, here's my idea, here's what I want to do. I got these writers. Everyone's just like, ah. 
it sounds interesting, but I basically called Brad Dorfman back up and blamed everything on Mike. I'm like, all the problems we had, it was because of Mike. I want to start a company with you. Do you want to do it? Because we didn't have any money. That's the thing. We needed someone who had like some infrastructure and some cash to like start something. And so he bought it. And I basically had my own company now with, again, with Vision, Brad Dorfman situation. I remember when Ed was like, wanted to start Toy Machine. I remember when he like told me the name, I was just like, oh, I, no, that's not a good name. Eh, I don't think, eh. I think I was debating, should I call the company Toy, Toy Skateboards or Machine Skateboards? It was one or the other. And I remember calling up Ethan Fowler and saying, okay, like, I'm boiling it down, I got two names that I really like. It's either machine or toy. And Ethan, Ethan's the person who says, why not both? Toy machine, and I was just like, hmm, okay. But it was Toy Machine Blood Sucking Skateboard Company. It was like the official full name of the company. Oh, I... Even though I always thought, like, maybe people are gonna think it's about vampires or something. In retrospect, names just turn into whatever they become. Now I think it's awesome, he's awesome, the visuals are awesome. It doesn't even matter. And again, like, Dorfman was Dorfman, I mean, so he would always suggest things to me and like, do this, do that, and I was just, it was just getting weird. So luckily I just got saved. I get this call from Swank out of the blue. He had already did, like started foundation. Like I didn't know him at all. He's just like, hey, hey uh, this is Swank. Like, I like what you're doing, I like your company. Have you ever thought about doing it, want to do it over here with me? And I was just like, fuck yes, like that's awesome. Cause it was like a real skateboard company, you know? run by skaters, whereas like Dorfman just felt weird. It was like such a weird situation. But Dorfman didn't own the name or anything? He did own the name. I think we thought about it to the point where like, yeah, if he like makes a stink, we'll change the name, but whatever, he never made a stink. So I feel like essentially Toy Machine started in its real like current state in 94, but I mean officially started in 93. We were filming, starting to try to make a video. I had all this vision equipment at my house, like set up, literally like reel to reel SVHS. Dorfman sent a skinhead to my house to pick up the equipment. I knocked on the door and there's this scary skinhead dude with a swastika tat. He's just like, I'm here to get Brad's shit. It's like, okay, it's in that room. Like, and he went in and took all the equipment out. <laughs> I had all the tape, yeah, I mean, all that stuff is essentially Toy Machine Live. We did it all in one night. It was kind of a joke. Skateboarding was small, so nothing mattered either. Everything was put in, there's no editing. I used every stupid wipe he had on his in his computer system. It's just chaos. It's just like, oh, Jerry, your bro has enough footage? Throw it in. He's on the team. You know, it's like, that's how loosey-goosey we were running it. Destroy. It doesn't matter if you're a girl or a boy. I say skate. Isn't skating great? Skate to school. Skate in the pools. I love to skate. <laughs> you know, there's, hey, let's do a company. Charlie Coatney. You know, there's just... Like the whole idea was just let's have fun. It's really only until Jamie Thomas got sponsored by me that we started like shaping things up because he kind of had visions. Pretty much just when they kind of brought Jamie Thomas on board when I, I guess I started to notice Toy Machine. You know, he's just like, who's this guy on the team? Why is he on? I'm like, I don't know. And he's just like, he should be off. And I'm like, if you want to kick him off, go for it because I'm too lazy to do that shit, you know? Heavy metal is sort of the in-between one. It's like nicely put together, there's parts, it's people tried. You know, it wasn't just a collection of all your footage thrown in there without editing. Like, let's bring a standard to the video. I love Toy Machine. I was absolutely enamored by a Toy Machine. I mean, the first skateboard video I saw was Welcome to Hell. And maybe that's my first introduction to him, it's just like, Welcome to Hell, all the slams. You know what my introduction to Ed was? Welcome to Hell, seeing his nutsack. <laughs> but I mean, really though, like it didn't take it themselves too serious. It was like kind of artsy, but all, yeah, also not so serious. And it was just like what I think a skateboard, skateboarding company should be. Playful and fun, but like good skating. I don't know, it's just, they had all the right chemistry. People always come up to me and say, man, Welcome to Hell is my favorite video. Thanks a lot for doing that. And I always say like, give Jamie the credit, you know? My only, the only credit I can take for Welcome to Hell is noticing that Jamie was gonna do the best job and staying out of his hair.
Ed was there, Ed was ripping. Jamie Thomas made that fucking thing. And he put those guys on the team. And he like, you know, he masterminded that whole fucking thing. Jamie Thomas put me on Toy Machine. And I had been a big fan of Ed, you know, for years and years. I mean, I, he was an older pro and he was an OG, but like, I mean, Ed, he's always been able to adapt with the times, I feel like. All his close friends always talk about him. He's just like ultra competitive. So like I could see like during Welcome to Hell how he would be like competing with Muska and Jamie for like, I'm gonna have a good part too. Not that he was old, I don't wanna say, but older. I like to use that term, he was older. No, it was always really inspiring because Ed was slamming. He was really trying to land like the best tricks he could for the video. He really wanted to put his all into it. And it made me really feel like I'm gonna try for this company, you know? This is my idol and he's now sponsoring me and he's still trying to rip as hard as he possibly can and just covered in bruises, the craziest hippers, getting knocked out all the time. I mean, he's a warrior. Ed's a street skater. Ed, Ed adapts to whatever different thing he's skating every day and he likes quirky stuff. Way before anyone started to dance on rails. And so if you actually watch those videos and there's all these subtle differences between the rails he's skating and even just hitting those things a lot of times, and that's what he was really good at. And I didn't really know how to work on a video because I was just a young kid and never really filmed a video part. I didn't really know how to do that. So I got to watch Ed kind of doing that. He's always had these little, these little ups and downs in his career, you know, but he always comes back, you know? And, and I remember, yeah, I remember at that time thinking like, damn, you know, Ed's, Ed still got it, you know? He, he, he does and, and he did and he does to this day, you know? That was a big modernization shift change. So it basically took Toy Machine from like, Charlie Coatney, send in your footage. After that, it was like, okay, now we know what Toy Machine is. It's this, it's fools going big, getting broke the fuck off, mixed in with cool art. That was a pretty good framework for Toy Machine. And I think that's probably Toy Machine's greatest legacy. I think there's some folklore about this story, but like I was at his house, I think he like was just opened up the closet door to like show me some painting. There was just like boxes of finished paintings all filed neatly in there. It was just disturbing. First off, that's fucked up. You have those, these boxes of paintings, like just get, get them out there. Just give them away. Like I was kind of pissed. I was just like, you're like doing all this stuff, but you're not sharing it. Like that wasn't really the way I saw things at that point yet. Thomas said, this guy Aaron does shows with skateboarders. He should do a show there. And so we sent this package of photos, like paintings. He sent me an envelope full of Polaroids of his paintings as like a portfolio. So I was just like, all right, well, he's got a lot. Like that was like, kind of like the, it was like, well, yeah, he makes a lot of stuff. So I guess he's good. <laughs> you know? We joke about it now, but I'm not even sure if he necessarily liked my work. Nobody knew anything about art. Ed didn't know anything about art, you know? I mean, maybe a little. He, I knew, he liked Larry Clark and he liked Egon Schiele, you know? So there were like two artists that he knew about that he was trying to kind of copying at the time. And I didn't really know that much either, except it being like, well, A, it's Ed Templeton. He's famous. B, he's willing to drive out all the art for free. I think Aaron rep responded like, yeah, this would be cool, but you know, we don't have any money. And I was like, oh, I'll just rent a van and drive it out there. They drove all the way across country and they pulled up in front of the gallery and knocked on the door. And that was the first time I met Ed. It was just like, hey, how's it going? I'm Ed, you know, can we unload? And then they just opened the thing and just brought all of this crap in. And you know, it was like an interesting experience because all my paintings, I mean, they clearly had a very like Egon Schiele sort of vibe. I was super influenced by that and people called it out and it was like a bummer to hear like I, you know see what people walk in and just say like oh it looks like Egon Schiele, Pff, dismiss it. But it's kind of you need that I think as an artist sometimes to get that criticism. As his work now is like highly sexualized a lot of the New York skaters like we're not liking it at all. We're not digging this what he had going on there. The show was primarily paintings. I had all these paintings and I the whole thing was paintings, but there was this doorway that kind of was right in the middle of the gallery that bothered me. 
that it didn't have anything on it. I did this cover the door in Polaroids. They're not any good, it was just like stuff, you know? But I did by chance have a few photos of my own boner and maybe someone else's boner. He took a piece of cardboard that was probably about you know, four feet long and then wrapped tinfoil around it as a frame. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was like his weird idea of what like would look cool or whatever. He just called it all my friends' dicks or all my friends' boners or something like that. And that was really the one that like, that was the one that really pissed him off. Like culturally, it was pretty a pretty conservative time. And you knew that maybe he got naked sometimes, like in a goof around kind of way. He didn't do anything that crazy, but like there was talk that he must be gay. The skating scene that Aaron was tapped into and that skater artist scene, it tends to be California white dudes from suburbia who had some access to art school or, or like an Ed's version self-taught through the art section at Barnes and Noble in, in Huntington, you yeah. know. And, and then those guys are all much more urban, you know, multi-ethnic, uh, different uh, class situations. And so there was like, so if someone's gay, that's a problem, you know? <laughs> but how are you, tell me again how you're not just a dumb jock, if that's your issue? I don't think Ed was like thinking like that. Like, oh yeah, I'm going to New York and those guys are also like homophobic and like hip hop. Like, I'm gonna make something with dicks. I think Ed just made something with dicks. <laughs> You know what I mean? I don't think it was like <laughs> intentional. I think it's absolutely overblown. Like I've, I've, uh, he, he sleeps naked. I've shared a room with him. He sleeps naked. I think that's kind of normal. I, I'm sure a lot of dudes sleep naked, you know, but he's not up cruising around in the living room of the hotel, like naked painting dudes or, I think all those stories are, are definitely blown out. I get this, I, this has been following me my whole career. I mean, like, but at the time at that, you know, in my, from my early, my first interview in Transworld, I, addressed homophobia. Like I saw it in skateboarding and wanted to like address it and, like, and speak out against it. Ed's kind of like Morrissey in that he has these magical powers and he can get men to fall in love with him even if they're heterosexual. And I don't know, even know how it happened. I was drunk and next thing I know, my pants are around my ankles and my little tally whacker was peeking out the bottom and I still to this day have no idea how or why my pants came off for that photo. And it's been everywhere. That photo was in Mocha. It's weird when people you don't know see your dick. For the longest time, there was like a, a certain group of people that, were, that truly believed Deanna was a beard. Like that I was married only on face value and that I was secretly gay. Because I would get this stuff like with the he and Ed Haters Club with Big Brother all, all the time. Ed had got so much hate mail because everyone thought he was gay. And there was so much homoerotic content in Big Brother to begin with, and so we just turned it into the Ed Haters Club. It all started in jest, and Ed thought it was funny. He, he really enjoyed the, the attention at first, because it was just, the best way to say fuck you to people like that is just to embrace it. So then we offered it. That's the thing, it's like once you open the floodgates, it's, it happens. So we did this little thing saying like, hey, join the Ed he man Haters Club. He's like a artsy farty gay skater guy, whatever, like, you know. So once we said, please write in letters, then it just went crazy to the point where we got kind of scared. I mean, it was like death threats and just really intense hate mail. He taunted it at first too, like he was kind of like, oh yeah, I hate, Ed, I hate on that. Like, yeah, oh, I guess. <laughs> and so he kind of brought it on, but then it really came on. And I think it got too much for him. <laughs> Well, people are fucking crazy. I mean, I find it crazy that anyone didn't see the humor in it or and or took it seriously. I've been around long enough to know that people are fucked. So yes, I think they genuinely actually did hate Ed. But I think overall it turned out to be one guy. Did they mention that? And we were like, oh, how, well, how can you prove it? And he's like, look at all the names. Every single name I made is a character from Bonanza. The rad thing about Ed, and I, I think his art speaks this way, and, and his personality is one that not going to put on a mask for you. And he expresses himself openly. And sometimes the way he expresses himself will offend people. He's completely opened all the creative boundaries that everyone tries to set a creative boundary and Ed's there to just smash it down. We need people like that. We need people that refuse to be censored creatively, whatever you want to put it, any boundary, authority, any of it. We need people to push those boundaries, you know, so that we can better understand exactly what's going on at that period. And Ed's somebody that documents what he sees. And that's enlightening. 
criticism is fine. Like I've never, yeah, I've never been the kind of person, you know, I've had people come up to me at art shows and just like, I have issues with your work. And instead of being like, fuck you, I want to like, I'm angry at you. I, I'd be like, why? Like, let, let me hear why. Cause I think it, hopefully it'll like make, you know, make me better, make, make me look at it a different way. I don't know. Oh, this I just found. And this is one of, one of Ed's first paintings or one of the first ones from that show. And I think it, says a lot about who Ed is. It's from 93, and it's a um, self-portrait of him and his dad. His first paintings, now looking back, and Ed, don't get mad at me for saying this, you'll probably agree, were like really bad. Like it took Ed a lot longer than some of the other artists from like our crew anyway, to kind of find his, find his vision. He puts all his faith in like volume. You know what I mean? And work, which is interesting going back to being like, oh yeah, he's famous and he's got a lot of stuff. Like even then it was just like work, 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 work. Notes to myself, the only people that like your paintings are people who like to look at naked people. Don't let things get out of control. No means no, never The only reason yes. your paintings are popular is because they have naked people in them. Ed's so nice and approachable and accessible and so is Deanna. I remember it made me feel like, oh, I could make a film, but I could hang out with him and he'd be cool. I probably shot for five, to five, seven days, something like that. We did like the beach and stuff because there was supposed to be a portrait of Huntington and Ed and his weird relationship with it. And then Ed interviewed people like the teen smokers. How long have you been smoking? About two years. Two years? What kind? Reds. Marlboro Reds? Yeah. How do you get them? I just asked some guy on the street to get it for me. Right on. What is happiness? Skating and getting drunk and loaded and smoking. Really? Yeah. How old are you? 15. Like Teenage Smokers, his Teenage Smokers series. Like when he like put that out, that was that was no more important than any other thing he was making. You know what I mean? It wasn't like he had this flash of genius, like, I'm gonna do teenage smokers and it's gonna be genius. It was just like part of a whole huge show and there was like one section that was just like these pictures that he had been taking on tour of kids smoking at like skate parks and stuff, at demos. And that the second he did that, all of a sudden like the art world started taking notice of him. You know what I mean? It was no longer like just kids world. Like it was like, oh, it was this, he like packaged like a series. You know what I mean? And then the art world were like, oh, teenage smokers. And even to this day, like it still comes up all the time. That's another part of him. It's that sort of straight edgy vegan part of him that's like very aware of all the fucked up stuff we do to ourselves that our culture kind of sells at us as like not being that bad. So that's sort of like his like cultural critical part of him. You know, he, he's into the, all the decay. I remember I have this photograph of like showing Ed for the first time this book, uh, Teenage Lust by Larry Clark. And I remember him being so excited, just looking through the pages, like, ah, whoa, this is, this is crazy, whatever. And he ended up using a couple of the images from Teenage Lust for one of his uh, skate video covers. It was heavy metal, it was like the Hessian dude with the hair. He had his, one of his first shows in New York at Alleged, and Larry Clark came to his show and was like, hey, use my photographs on your skate video. You didn't even ask me or pay me or anything. And he's like, oh, I thought you were dead. I didn't know. I didn't even know you were alive. Oh, fuck. That's funny. For Ed, I think like that book and definitely Tobin Yellen were really influential on like his development, especially Tobin. There's nobody else like Ed out there ever in this world, you know? And I think like a lot of people become artists throughout their life and stuff. And, and I think Ed just had no choice. He was just born the way he is. and. He's not even an artist, he's just Ed, you know? And like, I, I, I love that, you know? It's like the most pure form of art there is and, and it lies within Ed, you know? And that's like, that's just, it's cool. It gives me like chills thinking about it, kind of almost, you know? survived what Ed survived. No one, no person who started a, a company has survived like their entire team quitting on them and then building a new one. 
and then everybody quits. I'm building a new one. Everybody quits. No one survived that. Only fucking toy machine. I don't know why. Ed, why did they all leave you? Why did they all leave? Everybody except Deanna. They, they all left you. I mean, the time when Mike, Bam, and Carrie all quit and BA, I mean, like, that thing was crazy. I mean, it was crazy, crazy times. You know, on the phone, pacing around, crying, freaking out. And I'm screaming through the house, tears, you know, like, yeah, it becomes like, all I'm thinking is I want to hold this together. Like, I like this group of people. I want to keep it together. You know, it's, it's tricky when you talk about the, the time where we left, where I left, and a lot of people left. But that just happened. That was a natural progression. You know, people get up over things and they get burnt. And I don't have any regrets. Those are some of the best tours I've ever been on. You know, so fun. Alyssa, Maldonado, Bam, Chris, and all, everybody that came in and out of the team. I mean, these are the hardest calls of my life. The Sand one was the hardest call I've ever, like the hardest part of skateboarding I've ever had. Probably my lowest point in skateboarding was essentially what I did is kick Chris Sen off. I got a call saying, the budget is this and your team's too big. You can't, you can't basically support the team you have. You have too many people. The only way to really solve this is take a salary out of this budget. And so that's what I was presented with. So yeah, I mean, basically as a businessman, I just was like, Kerry's on the rise. He's a ripping young skater. I want to keep Kerry Gates. I have to kick Chris in off. I call up Chris in, I explain the whole thing to him. I'm, I'm crying, I'm freaking out. You know, I'm just like, dude, this, like, I don't know what to say. I don't know, what, I have to make this decision. You know, so yeah, I do all this stuff to like keep Kerry and he ends, and he, and ends up quitting anyway. He's just like, I'm going to ride for Habitat. So instantly, the first thing I think is like, okay, my budget problem just got solved the other way. You know, Carrie left, so now I can put Sen back on. Call up Sen immediately, like, dude, get back on. But his his position was like, dude, you already kicked me off. I'm not going to come back on the team. That's fucked, you know, which I can agree with. I can respect that. But, you know, the dagger was, he said, I would have rode for you for free. I mean, that just killed me. I started bawling. I was just like, what a dick move. I just, I, I kicked a guy off who I think is awesome and is my friend. And, like a guy who I thought was like, I don't know, one of the most amazing skaters ever. I mean, you've seen Chris Sand live, it's just insane. To have him basically say like, if you just would have said, will you ride for me and I can't pay you anymore? He would have said, yeah, <laughs> that just killed me. I was just like, fuck. So there, you know, there it goes, like a whole cavalcade of people have left the team. I was living at Ed's house at that time. I remember him just like, you know, basically just like sitting me down like saying like, hey, like Brad and Brian quit. And I think Alyssa quit later that night. I think he was just kind of like dealing with it, trying to figure out like if he wanted to maybe just give it up, like Toy Machine, or if he wanted to try and like rebuild, you know? I think there's been parts where you want to just <clears throat> throw in the towel on Toy Machine. It seemed like it, yeah. Or it seemed like maybe something he thought about. But then I think he once he made the decision, like, okay, you know, I'm gonna just, rebuild this, you know. I don't want to take like credit, but we definitely kind of like worked together. Like we watched a lot of Sponsor Me tapes together and discussed ideas about like potential team riders. Just kind of started rebuilding the team from there. You know, and it was grassroots. Like all these people, like we had a really good run of like farming people up. Josh sent us a video and we sponsored him and it just all felt good. It was fun being a part of sort of the this, the new team, I guess, that was being built. I just always loved Ed. If you look at Ed's parts, like, there's gnarly stuff in there, but he also is really creative, and the way that he approaches skateboarding has always been inspiring to me, you know? <laughs> God, I got a kid who's, like, ready to go, you know? He's, like, so amped, he's, like, nice and happy and just wants to skate, and, like, and so, yeah, I think it just started from that. It was like Austin and Josh for sure then. And like that's, So that's what the nuclear started. I mean, we started building it from there, I don't know. Toy Machine is like, it's like a cat has nine lives or something, you know what I mean? Like it just like, it's so amazing that like all these generations of Toy Machine and the different versions that we've all seen. I mean, there's been different versions yet. It's always remained true to this one aesthetic kind of, you know, but just the fact that like Ed has been able to like build these group, this team of skaters and stay culturally relevant all these years, you know, to this day, it's still one of the most popular, cool brands out there, you know, and I just, I find that amazing. It's not a lot of brands have done that. That's Ed, you know, like only someone like Ed can do that. I feel, I really do feel like that. I feel like anyone else would lock themselves into a certain 
genre of skateboarding and be like, well, we only are about this and we're only going to be about this. But Ed, the way he made Toy Machine, was able to kind of like acclimate to like whatever sort of guy he was bringing in. It was almost like Toy Machine gave birth to other Toy Machine skateboarders in a way to refill the teams. We're over at his house and we're looking at like all the people that have Toy Machine tattoos. And I was just like, wow, it just has like this momentum, you know, that it's just so cool. You know, I, I just think that Ed's kind of built a mythology that like relates to like reject skater kid. Like this is my shit, you know, like this guy's speaking to me. And then he just like, he just had such a succession of the most amazing skateboarders ever ride for him. And then, you know, with all the falling outs and risings and all that shit, but it just seems like maybe for what, 10 years, it's just been solid and just building. Honestly, I couldn't even sponsor a guy who needed to be babysitted. Like I have my own shit. I'm a hands off, like I said, I'm like the less stressful, least stressful guy. Like I put you on, I expect you to just do your shit. I don't want to have to like call you up every day, like, dude, you're not doing your shit, come on. At that point, I'm just over it. Like, and that's why everyone on the team is like a self-starter, basically. Leo just does his own shit. Colin just rips wherever he goes, you know? I don't have to worry about Colin. That's awesome. Like, I don't have to, I don't want to have to babysit these guys. So just, just be a professional, you know? Colin's epic. He's like adapting in a way that I don't see anyone else adapting. I mean, his whole team's just like straight murder. I mean, look who he has, you know? Like, Daniel Lutheran is like awesome kid. He's got good taste and cool style on his board. Obviously, he's extremely talented. And, uh, you know, everybody else is, it's, that team's all, it's like totally sick again, you know? So, um, I don't know, I guess just since Ed's so creative and colorful, like he, he attracts cool new kids, you know? It's so yeah. slippery, man. Part of my experience of getting like, having like early success with Thrasher was with when Jeff and Ed and those guys wanted to go shoot photos. I think it's the stuff that was in This Is Skateboarding. Not that he doesn't still rip, but that was his last big burst of like, big, you know, big handrails, kinkers, grinding hubba ledges and stuff like that. I mean, Jeff and Arto, they're the ones that got him to do that last big push. Yeah, that was in uh, Pasadena, and that was a day I went out with Arto and Ed, and Ed never skated a rail that big, and he was scared to skate it, you know? But watching us riding there and not really being bothered by it, you know, is another example of like peer pressure, one. But two, when you're around guys that feed off each other's skating and maybe skate a little different, that's like the best kind of dynamic to have. But that just shows you his ability, you know? And I don't think he was that young then. That's an 18 star lip slide. And he was probably in his 30s then or something. So mad respect for that. You know though, it's like you always think people are so much older when you look back. There was a time in Barcelona where he slammed a bunch of times and he like, he finally made it, but like he, he broke down and cried at the spot. And, he, and I remember, cause I wrote about it and it was like, he was 29. Well, what do you expect? He's 29. Yeah, like when he was like really skating big rails and stuff. You're just like, really, Ed? You're like, I didn't see this coming, you know, like. I mean, but he's just so talented. I had a deal with Jeff. Me and Jeff used to talk about it. I'm like, you know what? Don't, if I ever try to milk it, you gotta call me and tell me. Like, you're my friend. I want you to like call me and say, you've reached the point where you're milking it. Not so bad. I'll fucking lick that. That's right here. You want me to lick it? It's right here. Uh, See that? That's fucking brotherly love right there. Pure vegan blood for you. His advantage was he was the he got on handrails. Being able to get on handrails 
gave him a lot of relevancy. He's always been ahead of the curve on a few key maneuvers. He was early on the impossible, early on the nose blunt. Okay, how about the impossible nose blunt side? Yeah, the impossible nose blunt side. Who's done it since? No one. That's always the mark of a really fucking great skateboarder when they got one trick that no one ever goes back to and super fucking rare. He likes to rip. That's when he started calling himself the tempster and referring to himself in third person, jokingly, of course. Oh, the tempster will fucking lip slide this first try. Like he's a competitive person and he likes to rip. Like if you see him at a demo, that's the tempster. Oh, he was competitive in a f the funnest way when we did demos, I loved it. Because I'm not competitive, but I, I get really excited. We'd be battling, trying tricks on the same handrail or obstacle, and he'd just look at me and be like, I'm gonna do a first bitch, you know? And uh, I'd be like, fakey bitch, you know? Like, we would, it was just fun. But he's like the guy that goes to a demo and signs everyone's shirt. He taught me how to skate demos, actually. He was like, look it, when you skate a demo, you skate the best you can, and you try, and be nice to kids, and just put a good show on, basically. Dude, Ed's always the MVP. Always, like, like I said, first dude in, last dude out. I think it goes back to just like him being a professional about like taking his skateboarding job serious as opposed to like you see dudes sitting on the curb because like, Phew, I don't fucking like this, these obstacles, bro. Like, this sucks, I'm over it. Like, and you see Ed out there killing it. It's like, he's got the same shit you're trying to skate and you're probably, you know, your bag of tricks is a hundred times more than Ed's, but he's out there fucking going for it and giving it a hundred percent and the kids are stoked. When there's kids encouraging him and stoked that he's there, he just puts it on even stronger. He's, he's, he's a skilled dude, you know? He will write this today, he will nose blunt across and down any pyramid ledge in the world, you know? I think I don't know what, but I know I, I snapped it. It's gone. It's broke. Your foot? Yeah, my leg. You know my leg. What? It's broke, man. Right hey. there. The shin. Ambulance. The He's, okay, He's okay, Dan. He's okay. He's alright. They're both gone. I don't know, though. It's just my leg. I broke my leg. Oh, I broke my leg. No, yeah, it's just, there's something. I think he wants to ask you about. Basically, you wish I would retire because you're sick of me getting hurt. Well, it's not being... Yes, I do wish you would retire. And... Yeah. I don't know. It, it's, it's really weird because I do... I appreciate everything skateboarding has given him and myself because without it, you know, I wouldn't... I mean, our whole life has come from all your hard work, everything, you, our, all our travels, our, our home, our food, our health, everything. I have a bad feeling it's gonna take more than it gave and you're, you know, for you. I just feel, you know, you, you've given, you've given 110% and I think it's taken now 150. It just worries me and I feel like when people, I think a lot of skaters don't like they don't want to see anyone in their group or in their kind end, you know, because I feel like if if someone quits, then I think it kind of shows, ooh, you know, like maybe I won't be able to, and everyone wants to hang on to their youth, and our life is between me and him, and I don't know if these people are going to be here in 20, 30 years, you know, like, are, are you going to be the ones, you know, taking care of him, if, if that's where it goes, if, you know, if things turn bad, like, even when he, he broke his neck and one of his closest friends in skateboarding at the time said he wouldn't be caught dead skating with him if you know if he showed up with the helmet and I was just are you kidding me are you gonna be the one pushing him around in a wheelchair are you you know it's like you know I love him for the long haul I love him through everything I loved him before I knew anything about skateboarding I loved him through skateboarding and I want to love him after skateboarding and I just want him around I want him walking I want him talking I want him 
you know, I, he appreciates life so much, and I just know he could appreciate skateboarding, maybe not physically doing it, or at least not at the level he was doing it. And yeah, I just, this is a lifelong thing between us. This isn't just for right now. So I know I come off as a bitch that, you know, I don't want to see you. You never come off as a bitch. No, I, I know people get mad, you know, like, because I say things that I don't want you to skate, but, you know, I don't know if they've ever seen someone they love not recognize them, you know, or have your friends come and tell you later that they thought you were going to die. It's like, I don't know, you, you have so much more to give in other aspects. And through, you could still, you know, have positive impacts on skateboarding without actually being on it. She made me cry. I got heavy. <laughs> but now I'm really in a situation now, obviously, with the broken leg, it's like the chance of me hitting my head are, are better, you know? I mean, I, I just, I don't believe the way she does. Like, she thinks, like, one more hit and I'm going to turn into a vegetable. I went and talked to a neurologist. So I started getting concerned, like, dude, six concussions and a bunch of head injuries. Is that, like, what's going to happen? He's just like, oh, you know, it just depends on the people. Well, at least be able to like pump around in a park. That'd be nice, you know. But I think he'll skate again. I mean, do you think he needs to? Do you think he definitely doesn't need to or like have to or anything? Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's just such like a big part of his life that he just won't be able to help it. He might not like push himself and skate big rails and stuff again, but he's true? definitely gonna skate. What do you think? Like, I mean, you retired. Is there a difference between your career and why you'd want to retire versus his career and why he should keep going? He feels, you know, compelled to still be out there and skate and put himself out there where, like, I didn't, I didn't really care to be out there anymore, I guess. And, uh, and I, I mean, like, he also has this other thing. He has this other part of him that makes him relevant, which, like, to me, like, I don't have that. He's, his art, just right there, like, he, he's gonna be used in skateboarding forever just for his art, you know, even if after this injury, like he can't ever skate again. No one's gonna sweat him. No one, he's like Ed Templeton. He's, he's a fucking legend. As long as he feels like that's what he wants to do, he can do it because, I mean, he's just so influential that he can have stuff out pretty much as long as he wants. I'd never be like, oh, what's this Ed Templeton board doing on the wall, you know? Because yeah. <laughs> they'll always be awesome. I mean, I get really stoked to see this, you know, this, this kid that was just your typical kid that would be knocking on your door, asking for stickers and boards and just whatever, and just that escape from the stuff going on in his life to, like, go ride a skateboard and, and, and find himself in a way. And uh, I get stoked to see, I've been able to see him these, all these years and where he is now, and to see him as this, like, you know, iconic skateboard artist. Just, and just a great person. Made a mark and skated him forever. So it's, uh, it's pretty rad. So it shows anything's possible. Well, welcome everybody here on uh, March 22nd, 2014. And we have three gentlemen we want to introduce today. We'd like to induct them into the Soul Hall of Fame. We're starting off with Ed Templeton. Ed, if you want to come on up this way here. The chair. Ed, hey. 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 right here. Hey. Hey. All right, let's hear it for the guys. Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. Ace in the hole for skateboarding. Todd. This is your daddy. We call him. Yeah. 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 Yeah.